and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Frank Olson. Uh, I'll be your host today for today's uh, webinar session. Uh, we're going through the Egg Market Situation Outlook webinar. Uh, today, we actually have a really full slate. Um, everybody kind of on the line is, is going to have something to present. And I know uh, David Ripplinger, if possible, will be able to join us at the end here as well. So uh, with that, why don't we just jump right in and we'll start out with Dr. Brian Parman and we'll get uh, an update on the macro outlook and situation. So Brian, take over. All right. Thanks, Frayne. All right. So it's been uh, a few months uh, since I, I've given a lot of these macro updates um, over the years that we've been doing this. And I haven't done anything with it in the last several months because really not a lot has happened uh, so far to, to really report on. It's been pretty status quo. But the re, uh, the latest inflation report came out this uh, last week, the CPI, Consumer Price Index. And I just wanted to touch on, I thought this would be a good time to give a little bit of where we're at now, what it might look like going forwards and uh, kind of some expectations on, on what the markets are looking at, as well as kind of my own uh, expectation and forecast, I suppose. So the first, here's here's the uh, this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics monthly headline inflation. So I'm not going to touch on core inflation so much right now, uh, but but what the what the latest number said was uh, you look here. This is the actual April number for annualized inflation rate, uh, 3.4 percent, and there was some news made that oh well inflation's down. Uh, from the previous month. Well, it is, but the fact is really since June of, of 2023, we've been just kind of oscillating between 3.1% and 3.7%, I guess, in August and September, but even this year, 3.5% in March. So when they've been talking about that this current inflationary situation that we're in has been sticky or stubborn to to adjust, this is this is what they're talking about. The fact that it's the Fed, the Federal Reserve's target inflation rate is two percent, uh, or or maybe maybe slightly below it, or just around that two percent mark, and it's just not a, hasn't really approached that, um, and it's been pretty consistent. You look, and we're we're going on a year of three to three and a half percent inflation, which is why that why they have not um, reduced uh, the federal funds rate. And so what that's done with the 30-year mortgage rate so far uh, peaked um, right around the tail end there of, of 2023 at almost 8%. Uh, and this is for a 30-year mortgage. The last few months, uh, it's been over 7%. And right now, the national average is just a, just a shade over 7% for that 30-year mortgage rate. And again, I want folks to keep in mind that there are other factors in the economy that influence the interest rate besides the federal funds rate. That is one thing. It is a major thing, but there are other things that can happen. I mean, you, you just look at this chart right here. The Federal Reserve hasn't increased the federal funds rate in, in many, many quarters. And yet interest rates have gone all the way up to almost 8% back down below seven and now back above six. And the Fed hasn't moved rates. They they do some other things with, with assets they hold as well. And they've been offloading some of that. But still, you can see that it can oscillate even and change even if the Fed does really nothing. And a lot of that has to do with expectations. And the other reason I wanted to hit on some of the macro stuff today was the Ninth Federal Reserve District, which is our Federal Reserve District out of Minneapolis. Um, they've come out with their uh, surveys from the from the first quarter and of 2024. And right here at the bottom of this table, you can see what uh, in the first quarter of 24 the operating uh, and uh, fixed and variable costs were on, on loans, machinery fixed and variable loan uh, rates, as well as real estate. And I was a little, little surprised that even in, through the first quarter, it, it, it had uh, essentially come down or, or stayed about the same, really, uh, from, from quarter three. Uh, for, from quarter four of 2023, you look, it's come down a little, the rates have, uh, across most of the ag lending sector in, in our district, but not a lot. Uh, now, maybe... 
we'll see some of that moving even even more into uh, quarter two, which which hasn't concluded yet. But so far, rates held steady, even though in, and if I go back and show you, you know, early part of 2024, rates were significantly lower than the, the, uh, on the 30 year than they were uh, uh, lower, I should say, in 2024, the beginning part than the tail end of 2023. And that didn't have much of an impact at all on ag loan rates, uh, real estate, machinery, operating, fixed or variable. All right. And so then the other thing they ask uh, in their survey uh, when they put it out is they ask the lenders that they're surveying and, and the percentage of respondents who reported increased levels for the past three months. So this would be increased levels for the past three months compared with the same period last year. Loan renewals or extensions, the last three months, North Dakota, 42% said uh, they saw an increase over the last three months, Wisconsin, 33%, district-wide, 23%. Increase in loan demand over the last three months, Minnesota up 54%, North Dakota, 58% reported seeing that Wisconsin, everyone, and South Dakota over 50% seeing that, which makes for a 55% district-wide increase in loan demand uh, in, in agriculture over the last three months. Then they ask sort of a forward-looking question, uh, do you expect, or what do you expect in, in the next three months? And this is increased levels. Loan demand continuing to expected to increase. And in North Dakota, a pretty sizable increase. Wisconsin's still 100%, but North Dakota is two-thirds essentially saying they expect increases in loan demand, uh, partially because... I, I believe we, we've had, you know, cash reserves being depleted a bit. 2023 wasn't a bad year, but it certainly wasn't a, a banner year. And 2024, the projection from USDA is much lower net farm incomes, even than 2023, uh, potentially below average. So that's kind of what they're looking at coming down the pipe. And then 42% in North Dakota saying an increase in loan renewals or extensions. Uh, also increases in collateral requirements as well. So let's kind of shift real quick on, on to the forward looking portion of this. And the first thing I wanna show is what the uh, April unemployment rate number was, which was 3.9%. Why do I show unemployment? Because it's a big factor in uh, the Federal Reserve determining if rates should come down, are we nearing recession, et cetera, et cetera. And I put this whole chart on here going back to 2024 just to show Yes, unemployment has edged up a tick. You know, it's right there at 3.9%, but it's still, uh, you know, the big spike right here in 2020, that's obviously COVID. But even when things were going pretty well prior to the financial collapse of 09, unemployment during that time was 4.5%. And so 3.9 is still a very low mark uh, for unemployment. Anything below 4 really is, is a pretty low number. Um, and it's kind of right where it's been over the last six years outside of the, the COVID period. So there <coughs> isn't anything, <coughs> excuse me, right now that the Fed would be looking at as far as the employment sector saying, well, there's unemployment starting to creep in, uh, maybe, but but it's pretty slow. And, and so far, there's still a lot more jobs out there than job seekers. The other thing that's looked at quite often is GDP growth, Okay. Well, that's remained positive, you know, for the last year plus. And the forecast from the S&P is that uh, uh, the U.S. economy is on track for about a 2.5% average growth rate in 2024, which is not really a red flag or an alarm bell for a recession. And not only that, but despite hanging out there with these higher rates for all of 2023, there was still a yearly growth rate of 3.1%, which most consider, I wouldn't call it super strong or anything, but certainly not bad at all. So, and that was, it, there's been this expectation that there was going to be this slowdown, that this was all coming, and then the Fed was going to have to uh, reduce rates for that reason. And it just isn't true. Um, so far, so good that you, and essentially the U.S. has done, the U.S. economy has absorbed these higher interest rates taken them in stride and, and, and continued to clip along pretty well, actually. Um, so then when might we see the first uh, federal funds rate cuts? 
And if you listen to the market, it's always the next meeting for some reason. They they believe the Fed is it, except for except for uh, the June meeting, which is coming. Pretty over ninety percent believe that there will be no change to the federal funds rate in June, which is a huge change from January when I looked at that, where everyone in the market believed it. I did not believe that there would be a, a, a rate cut in June. Um, mainly looking at those GDP growth numbers, uh, unemployment, um, how many job openings per per unemployed person, all those factors that that they look at, as well as things like is there this big increase in bankruptcies or anything coming. There's been some, but that has more to do with commercial real estate than 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 anything else so far. And the September meeting will essentially be the next pivotal meeting. Uh, with June, basically everyone baking in that there won't be a rate cut in June. September will be the most pivotal, and most in the market believe there will be a 25 basis point rate cut. I do not believe that. I think based on the numbers that we're looking at right now, something it, it's not going to, we're not going to slow trend to a rate cut in September. Something that I can't predict would have to happen. Uh, that no one can predict in order for that to to be the case. I think if we even stay around four percent unemployment and GDP growth clips along at two percent, which is kind of what's being forecasted, and inflation just keeps stubbornly staying at three two point seven percent two point nine, the Fed's going to want to see multiple months of inflation subsiding before they actually make a rate cut. And so that's and that's the main reason why I don't think it's not going to hit 2% and they're going to be like, okay, time to cut rates. I think they're going to want to see it because when you look at those trends I showed you before, it could dip below two and then back up to two and a half, three pretty fast, which is something I absolutely want to avoid. I guess the other thing to keep in mind, one of the things they really want to avoid the most is cutting rates and then having to raise them very soon afterwards because they were cut too early and and all of a sudden you had some the economy heats up and, and then they have a bigger inflationary problem and then finally the vast majority of people in the market they you know huge percentage believe that by december there will be a 25 to 50 point uh, uh basis or a basis point cut i think that's possible but it's going to take that that inflation, that inflationary number to trend lower for quite a while and those unemployment numbers to edge up uh, before that would happen. And I don't think there, and most people don't think there will be any rate movement in November because they're not going to want to make a change during the election. Um, they don't want to influence it any more than they they have to. So, so in essence, November's off the table. So really the only opportunities for the rest of this year that, that anyone's kind of circling are September and December. I don't think September will happen. And I'm if I was betting, I would bet December doesn't either, but it's probably the most uh, likely candidate uh, uh, for when that might happen. But even then, if rates are cut, it's probably just going to be a quarter of a point, half a point, in other words, 50 basis points before any of that might happen. So there's the kind of the outlook as, as I see it based on the data that we have uh, so far. So normally we take questions at the end of the uh, uh, webinar, but I have to, I have a meeting that I have to go to here in, in a little while. So if anyone has any questions real quick um, that they'd like, like asked live or answered live, I'd be happy to take it. Otherwise you can obviously always uh, email me with, uh, with another question you might have. Well, let's do this. I'm going to jump into my session next. Um, and when I'm finished, um, I'll double check the Q and A in the chat to see if there's anything that's popped up for you. Okay, Brian. Yep, sounds good. Uh, so again, good afternoon, uh, Frain Olson, crop economist, marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, this is my contact information. So if you do think of something that you want to visit about later on, I'd be happy to try and and respond to that. Um, either email or or cell phone probably works the best. So. Like I said before, we've got a lot to cover today, so let's just dive right in and get going. Um, first, I want to do kind of a quick overview of some of the things we're going to talk, talk about in just a few minutes here. Uh, number one, we're going to review a little bit of the information that came out in the WASDE, which is the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. That was the one that came out last week. 
Um, there was, a, I guess the, the general consensus was that it was a slight positive for corn and for wheat and a slight negative for soybeans. Now, as we go through this, you'll see that there weren't a lot of big adjustments uh, that the that the market had anticipated the numbers pretty closely. Um, the other thing would remind everybody is the May report is the first time that we get official uh, WASDE estimates for the current marketing year. So the crop that's being planted right now. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. The other thing that's been a hot topic within the news uh, recently has been the heavy rains and flooding going on in southern Brazil, in particular the, the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, which is uh, causing some problems for their soybean harvest and the crop quality, in particular soybean crop quality. Um, and I'll show you some maps in just a minute to give you an idea of kind of the general region. So most people think about in Brazil, think about uh, Mato Grosso, which is that really big state in the northern part of Brazil. This is down at the very south, the southern tip. There's a, there's a cluster of, of smaller um, states down in that region that do produce a significant amount of soybeans, a very high density of, of soybean production from an acreage standpoint, but also from yield standpoint. So we are starting to take a little bit more off the top of that Brazilian soybean crop. Uh, we're also getting in the middle of the hard red winter wheat tour right now. Um, we're in day three today. So at the end of today, we'll get the, the daily results and then we'll come out and put out a final official number for what the, the tourist is expecting for the hard red winter wheat crop. Now, most of the, most of the regions have been on day one and day two have been in Kansas. Uh, today, they will dip down and kind of follow along the southern tier of counties in Kansas and the northern part of, of Oklahoma. So we'll get an idea. The yields are coming out much better than they did last year. Just as a reminder, last year, this time of year, um, Kansas is in a pretty significant drought. Um, thus, the, the very low numbers you see from last year. So the yield yield calculated reports are coming out much higher than they did last year, actually a little bit above kind of the long-term average. Um, and if this trend continues, we'll likely see the wheat tour estimate for U.S. Uh, hard red winter wheat be a little bit larger than at least USDA is currently forecasting coming out of Kansas. Um, and finally, I'm going to towards the end of the presentation, I'll talk to you a little bit about the frost damage as well as some of the drought damage now in the Russian wheat crop. And that's getting to be a really big deal. We've, we started kind of a rebound or a rally in um, the U.S. wheat market prices when there was a, uh, about two weeks ago, there was some frost damage in Northern Europe, primarily in the German Germany area. Um, and then not long after that, there was some additional frost damage that came out in Russia. And that's on top of some drought damage that's already occurring. And again, I'll show you some maps in just a minute, which is really putting now kind of a lift and some support into the, into the U.S. Um, wheat price complex. So let's talk about the reports that came out first. So this is the ending stocks forecast for old crop. So that's the crop we harvested last year. We're kind of in the middle of the marketing year right now. Um, as I will do, it has have done in the past, the blue row on the very top is the average trade guess. That's the average trade estimate. Um, the black towards the bottom, the, the highlighted black row is what we saw last month. And then obviously the red low on the bottom, red row on the bottom is what we got um, on May 10th, which is about a week ago. So when, what I really recommend is that we start comparing the blue to the red, because the blue is the number we expected to see and the red is the number we actually got. So for old crop numbers, there, again, wasn't a lot of shock. There wasn't a lot of kind of new news that came out that people weren't expecting to see. Um, we did see ending stocks for wheat drop just a little bit because there's a small bump in the export forecast. Interesting enough, that was all in the hard red spring wheat category. So the the increase in exports was all driven by this the uh, increase in expected um, sales export sales for hard red spring wheat. Uh, for corn, there was just a small uptick in exports, a small uptick in ethanol production or consumption, excuse me, which then took the uh, took the number down a little bit. And for soybeans, there's really no change from last month. Um, and again, very, very similar to what the trade is expecting. Now shifting into new crops. So this is the same numbers, but for the crop we're planting right now. Again, May is the first month that USDA prepares these forecasts. So we don't have a reference point from last month. Notice that the NA going across the highlighted or bolded black row towards the bottom. 
So in the very top, the blue row, again, that's what the trade was expecting to see. Red row on the bottom was what we actually got. Um, the trade had a little bit higher expectations for ending stocks than what, what actually came out through USDA. Uh, same for corn, and then but a little bit higher on soybeans. And again, that was kind of the mentality behind the recommendations or the suggestion before that the report itself was slightly positive for wheat and corn and slightly negative for soybeans. So when we compare the numbers we saw for 2024, 25, the new crop versus the numbers that were an old crop, what are some of the changes that USDA is expecting on the consumption side? We know the production side because we have the, um, the uh, prospective plantings report numbers that came out. We know what the trend line yield is. So there really wasn't a lot of shock value on the production end. It was the question about, so what, how, what is USDA going to do on the consumption end? And there was, because the production was higher, we're forecasting slightly lower prices from this year into next year. Um, there was a slight bump in both exports as well as some domestic consumption. And therefore, the numbers came out similar to what the trade was expecting, but not identical. So again, no big shocks, no big uh, kind of revelations that came out, just some tweaking that went on in our expectations. We also got an update for production estimates out of South America. Again, once again, USDA really ha has this tendency over time to make these smaller changes over from month to month rather than making big adjustments. Uh, when we look at Argentina, there was a small reduction in the corn number. Um, and, and a lot of that was because of some... Uh, what they what they call um, there was a disease that started showing up uh, stunt within the within the corn crop and so that's really starting to impact corn yields out of Argentina. Um, a lot of private forecasters are looking at some significantly lower numbers than that, but USDA again is starting to take that number down because of some of the disease problems showing up in in Argentina. No no adjustment on soybeans from last month. Um, there was a small reduction in corn in the Brazilian corn area. And then there was a slight reduction in the soybean um, area, not as much as what the trade is expecting. Trade is expecting a little bit lower number, uh, but, uh, but the Brazilian soybean production is starting to come down. I do now think given the, the rainfall and some of the challenges they're facing, as we get into the June report, we'll obviously see a, a, a more significant drop in that Brazilian, Brazilian soybean number. I know that USDA is tracking that very closely and trying to update their forecasts as they move through. Uh, we did get, again, a, a kind of a summary statement now for corn production and uh, soybean production. Um, these were the numbers that came out on the, again, the blue on the top is what for total bushels produced is what the trade was expecting. The red on the bottom is what we actually got. There weren't any big surprises here. I just wanted to reiterate that, that from a procedural standpoint, from a methodology standpoint, USDA tends to follow a very similar methodology. We know that they're going to use the planted acreage number from the prospective plantings report and that they will be using a trend line yield. Um, again, they're look, going back 30 years. They're looking at what, what kind of trend line yields do we have in both corn and soybeans. Now, they do periodically adjust that trend line up or trend line down just a little bit based on planting progress. But so far this year, planting progress for both corn and soybeans has been pretty much right on track with what we'd see historically at this time of year. Plus a little bit, minus a little bit, but it very, very typical pace for planting. So again, no big shocks, no big revelations within those numbers. Um, we did also get some updates on the production report for wheat production. Um, again, USDA is starting to do their, their not only satellite imagery, their farmer surveys, but also now some actual yield reports where they go out and do individual field surveys. Just wanted to give you a summary here. Again, all wheat production was for this is for 2024 now this would be for the the, the crop we're going to be harvesting in in july starting with winter wheat um, a slight reduction from what the what the um trend the excuse me the trade was expecting but an increase from uh, last year's numbers and again part of that is because of yield and part of it is because of planted acreage for all winter wheat and when we look at what the trade is expecting versus what we got, a slight reduction, slightly no lower number than we expected. But the hard red winter wheat number was up a bit. And again, that's because of the yields that we saw. The soft red winter wheat number, although took some of that back out again. So when we look at all winter wheat, 
relative to hard red spring versus soft red, I mean, hard red winter versus soft red winter, basically the Kansas crop versus let's say the Illinois wheat crop. The Illinois wheat crop is, is taking a bit more of a hit, not quite as good a yields as what people had first been expecting based on the conditions today. And then the white winter wheat, which is primarily in the Pacific Northwest, um, up just a little tiny bit from what the trade was expecting. But again, nothing substantial, nothing to really cause major turmoil in the markets. So let's talk about what is creating the turmoil in the marketplace. If you look at this map, uh, this is for soybean production in uh, Brazil. The darker the green, the more tons or the more bushels of soy are produced. And what normally when we talk about this, we're looking at this Mato Grosso region, uh, Mato Grosso do Sul, the uh, Goiás area up in the northern part. We don't spend a lot of time talking about this southern region, but again, in the southern region, right near Uruguay, this Rio Grande do Sul, that's the region where they've had really some very, very heavy rainfall. When you see photos on the news about the flooding, um, there was a dam that burst on one of the rivers. This is the region that we're talking about right now. And Rio Grande do Sul, just as an individual state, accounts for about 14, almost 15% of all the soybean production in the country. So it is something that can have a significant impact when you think about it from that perspective, okay? Now, this is also a, a, a kind of a map or gen, a computer generated map from radar imagery uh, for the last month of how much precipitation has fallen in this region. And if you look in the very bottom at that scaling, anything in that light blue is more than 250 millimeters. So 250 to 500 millimeters of rainfall. So conversion into the, um, the imperial units, 300 millimeters of rainfall is the equivalent of almost 12 inches of rainfall. And there are regions within that zone that have gotten well over that. So you can about imagine, uh, and we've seen some of that in our in our state as well, most of that rain came in about the last two weeks. So the, even though this is a monthly total for 12, uh, for the 30 days, most of the rainfall that we're talking about has occurred in about the last two weeks. So you can about imagine getting 12 or 14 inches of rain in about a, a two week period and what that would do to your soybean crop in the middle of harvest. So there's some real challenges, not only for quantity, but also for the quality coming out of that region. Now, finally, I want to shift to, to wheat production in Russia. So this is a map of Russia, and I do want to point out some landmarks just to get everybody's kind of bearings geographically. So Ukraine is right here. So as we go kind of north, up, up in the upper left-hand corner, that would be moving into France and Germany and England from a, from a, 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 um, from a geography standpoint. And this, you can see this little uh, blue on the very edge, that would be the Black Sea. So this is where they produce spring wheat. Now notice the spring wheat production is primarily quite a ways from their major ports, which is in the Black Sea area. So even though Russia does produce a significant amount of spring wheat from a bushels count, it's far enough away from the export market that they don't tend to export a lot of hard reds, what we would consider to be like a hard red spring wheat. And it accounts for about 25 to 30% of the total bushels produced in Russia. More importantly is what they do for their winter wheat crop. So it'd be very similar in a quality standpoint to like our Kansas wheat. Again, here's Ukraine. As we move kind of to that to the left over here, we're going to get into France and Germany and England. Here's the Black Sea region right here. So notice that the hard red winter wheat, what we would classify as a hard red winter wheat, is really grown very, very close and tight up next to this Black Sea region. So getting Winter wheat from Russia into the export market is relatively straightforward. They do have to, to move it and truck it. They can use some barge traffic coming to the Sea of Azov, which is right here versus the Black Sea. But it's relatively straightforward and easier to get those bushels into the export market. So this region now that has had some frost damage as well as the, the re reaching the dry weather is having an impact. So this is hard red winter wheat, what we would classify as hard red winter wheat. And here's the soil moisture map as of, uh, what, a couple days ago. So notice this brown region. Um, so this is the surface soil moisture. So we're really looking at that root zone of the plant. It's not something that's going really deep into the soil profile. So again, there's been a combination of both frost damage as well as very dry soil moisture conditions. Um, the current forecast, if you look at the very bottom here, from a private forecasting company out of Russia, as well as Econ, which is the official 
uh, Soviet government um, forecasts are starting to take the size of that Russian wheat crop down pretty significantly from the combination of those two events. So again, from a wheat pricing standpoint, this is now starting to play a role in the U.S. wheat market, trying to put trying to put a little bit of a lift back into the into the wheat markets, especially spring wheat, but also winter wheat. We're going to have to keep our eyes on that and listen very, very carefully as they enter their harvest period. So with that, I'm going to finish my session and I will look to see if there are any questions. Doesn't look like there's any questions or anything in the chat. Uh, so Brian, you're off the hook for now. Um, I will hand things over to Tim Petrie to cover the livestock section. Thanks, Brian. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist, talk a little bit about maybe the longer term cattle situation today. The calf marketing season for uh, last the calves that were born last year is pretty well over. Uh, you know, the some of the markets aren't even reported now by USDA and and uh, calving started and so on. So uh, we ended up the year at record high prices and and kind of expecting that to continue. Again, these are year over year prices and don't take into consideration the seasonal. So we did end up at record high prices this spring. Prices this fall for calves are likely going to be lower than they finished up this spring because the seasonal pattern is is low around October 15th, still higher than last October, but, you know, keep that in mind. But, uh, you know, we're at record high levels and expected to continue there, although a lot of factors affect it. You know, Frayne was talking about corn. You change corn, um, 10 cents, change feeder cattle, buck calves in, in the opposite direction. So a lot of things going on there. But the highest prices for cattle always occur when we're in herd rebuilding earnest. So I'm going to talk more about that. You have seen the charts on the right hand side before the, you know, we reduced the beef cow herd five straight years because of drought. And the worst drought was at, at the end of 2002. There you see all the dark colors on the drought monitor and below the dark the chart below on the bottom right is, you know, the dark green is where the cow cake, cows are and then the drought red dash lines overlaid by then to 2022 over three quarters of our cows were in drought and we'll look at the slaughter numbers in a minute and so on but that's why we reduced the herd we had very significant improvement in moisture levels look at the drought monitor in the upper left hand corner just came out this morning and uh, for, throughout a lot of cattle country kansas being an exception there and you know, uh, you know, some in Western uh, Texas and then in North Dakota, um, we just uh, had a, a, a drought call this morning with county agents and, and some people. Daryl Richeson is now going to be our new state climatologist. So he mentioned uh, particularly Western North Dakota is still dry and uh, has le had less than normal precipitation. You see that up there in North Dakota and then in the north, along the north uh, particularly northeast, northern North Dakota dry. But for all a cattle country, a significant improvement on the map below that then, 14% of, of uh, cows are now in drought compared to three-fourths of 10 to 2022. So this would be a quite more normal or average, or I don't know what word you want to use there. It's always dry uh, someplace usual. And so there is interest in herd rebuilding. Uh, last time I showed you that the Northern Plains, including North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, Montana, all had more replacement heifers. And you can go back and look at that chart from last time if you want to. And so there is interest in herd rebuilding, giving prices, and the uh, moisture situation. Uh, a little bit about hay. Uh, on Friday, Frayn mentioned the WASDE report and also the crop production report. The USDA does a hay stocks report as of December 1st and May 1st. And so as expected there on top is the North Dakota hay stocks. Since 1999, we were expecting hay stocks to be up because we had uh, re good production of hay last summer with the improved moisture condition in North Dakota. The exception again is up along the northern uh, counties had uh, reduced hay production and then uh, in the southwest. But for a lot of North Dakota, a good average hay crop. In fact, Sioux County, for instance, had three years of rainfall in one year and their uh, 
you know, they had a lot of quantity, but the quality that, because of the rain, they couldn't get up. So, you know, we, we had a good production and then uh, less usage of hay this winter because of the, the warm temperatures. Talk more about that in a minute, too. And so we're up above average on hay stocks. Uh, on the bottom, a kind of a, a chart that I like to use th that uh, Adnan Keyes, who, who was our former state climatologist, unfortunately passed away a few months ago. And like I said, now Daryl Richardson's going to take over. But he had this North Dakota drought severity index, that purple line down there showing when we had droughts. And so you see uh, what that does to hay stocks the next uh, year. The, the arrows are up when we had a drought, like for instance, in 2006, we had a drought. Look what it did to hay stocks in 2007. In 2008, uh, drought again, and what it did in, in 2009, going across then to the end. Again, the worst drought here in the last decade was in 2021. And uh, according to Adnan's severity map, and then our stocks were really, really low in 2022, the lowest on this chart. And so, uh, but now, you know, the average is up there about uh, uh, a million, 1.1 million ton, and we're, we're uh, above that with hay stocks. So uh, we've had relatively high beef cow slaughter for a number of years because of the drought. And again, with the tremendous improvement at the end of 2023, just last December, a third of our cows were still in drought. And now we're just down in the teens. So even this year, then we've continued to see improvement and kind of hope that continues. So here's the weekly beef cow slaughter. Again, the green line 17 to 21. Actually, seven, 2017 was a dry year. 2021 was a dry year. And the, in the years in between were more average. And, and so then the uh, purple line up there, again, was the worst drought in the U.S., uh, uh, at 2022, really high slaughter, way above average. Last year, we brought slaughter down a little bit, but still above average, and and we were still dry. And but although we improved by the end of the year, but now this year, the red line, of course, is we're really taking beef cow slaughter down with the improved uh, conditions. And uh, you know, just talked to my counterparts down in Texas and Oklahoma yesterday, and they've got green grass down there, but. In terms of herd rebuilding uh, down there, producers are very, very cautious. And we're going to look at the reason for that in a minute. And, uh, you know, looking at weather and also, you know, we have high interest rates and, you know, still thinking about the last cycle back in 14 and 15 when price dropped off. So there is interest in herd rebuilding. It's cautious interest. We see now with lower beef cow slaughter that we're going to do that. We don't have a lot of heifers on hand that were that were bred to, to calve this summer, as I talked about last time. But we are going to breed more heifers this summer quite likely, you know, unless it gets very, very dry, but still a herd rebuilding will probably be modest at best. So Daryl Richardson covered this this morning. So I just thought I'd talk about it in that we are now transitioning in the U.S. from El Nino to La Nina. And what does that mean for us? And so starting in the upper right or the upper portion is precipitation, which is all which has so far held kind of true to what expectations might be for that transition. You see up there uh, for North Dakota would be uh, above average precipitation in parts of North Dakota, central North Dakota in particular, but southwestern North Dakota still kind of dry in pockets up there in the north. Uh, but Texas uh, way above normal precipitation. And that's what my counterpart said. And we see there's flooding in areas of Texas and so on. So they're receiving good moisture as would be predicted for this summer then. Uh, for most of North Dakota, we would expect average precipitation, maybe in the far east, a little above is the green there, but still a pretty good down through Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas and so on. But by fall, the precipitation expected to drop off sharply, sharply. you get quite dry. And so that's why there's a cautious uh, herd rebuilding down there, even though they've got grass is looking ahead to that. And, and North Dakota too, by fall, it says we're going to dry off. And then on the bottom is temperatures so far, holding with that transition phase of parts of North Dakota. There have been, uh, and including Fargo, have been above average temperatures this spring. 
and uh, with some normal arrest, but by summer going just to average temperatures and by fall a warmer than normal fall. So again, predicting weather is just like predicting cattle prices. Things come along and and uh, and, and affect that. But uh, you know that's what uh, Daryl covered today in, in in terms of what's expected for this summer. And then. Uh, I didn't cover the individual market classes of, of cattle because, again, our calf marketing season is over. There is kind, kind of interest, I guess, in, in what uh, cow-calf pairs are selling for and maybe bread cows. Stockman's is having a sale today, so you could check their website tomorrow to see what cows bring. But this was the May 2nd sale, you know, the top end of cow-calf pairs for those young uh, uh, heifers that have calved up, you know, up there, 37, 800, up $3,900 and, uh, and bread cows up there, at, you know, 27 up to 28, 75. That's about, I look back at a year ago, sale is about 400 to $500 better than last year, which I guess, uh, you know, could be expected with the prices, but, uh, again, uh, on the dry side out west. So with that, I'm going to, uh, 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 stop sharing and let's see what's happening with the farm bill. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Can we see that? Okay. Yep. You can see it fine. Thank you. And hear me. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. So yeah, Ron Haugen, extension farm management specialist. And I'm going to talk today about some farm bill proposals, uh, specifically about the ARC P and PLC, uh, part of things. Uh, both the Senate and the House have a couple different versions. I I always hate to talk about these proposals because you know things are going to change, but everybody wants to know about what's going on. So so I uh, so I don't so I hate to study things and then things get changed. But I will present what we know today, and we know it won't be exactly how it's going to turn out. But we'll we'll I'll give you what I have. Um, there's a lot of talk about the reference prices, of course. Um, and the, in both in the both versions, uh, there's not much detail yet, but they do plan on raising the reference prices. Uh, the best guess is five to fifteen percent higher, uh, and that's something that was kind of speculated and, and, and predicted that the next farm bill would have higher reference prices. As far as base updates, now this last farm bill we did, um, that we did not have a base update, we had a yield update. The previous farm bill before that, we had base updates and yield updates. So um, with this now, the Senate version has a base update only for underserved producers. And then how do you define an underserved producer? That would be veterans, um, uh, low uh, low financial situation, other other things. I don't know how they define it exactly. Um, the house, uh, there would be a base update for all producers. My speculation is that it would probably there'd be some backlash uh, for that. They'd want to have it for everybody, so uh, everybody would have the chance to do this. As with a base update, there's different ways of doing that. You can have a forced base update, or you can have a voluntary one as well. So we'll see how it all turns out. Also, the payment yields would, would, would probably change as well with the new base acres, and that could be a lot of different situations there. It could, a lot of times they just take a percent of recent yields. It could be a, the Olympic average or some kind of other average to update your yields along with your base. So the farm bill is is progressing along the different ideas and it's pro as 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 was predicted it probably will look like the existing farm bill with some tweaks. But here is one thing that it was surprised me. Now this is this slide is probably a little mislabeled. It's payment limits. It's not the payment limit. It's it it's the it's it's the um adjusted gross income uh, that limits your payment, I should say. So if you have a, an adjusted gross income over um, uh, 900,000 was the was the way it was in this current far farm bill, uh, then you would be limited on your on your total payments. Um, so the Senate threw this in, they 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 dropped it from 900k to 700,000 except for they 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 had a 1.5 million for high valued and especially crop producers i'm not sure how that's defined probably vegetable and fruit producers i'm not sure and the house keeps it the way it was 
at 900,000 um, adjusted gross income limit, but it does index for inflation, which they have never done before. So we'll see what happens when the House and Senate uh, iron that out. Also with the ARC County guarantee, it's been at 86% for the last two farm bills, okay, since we, they started on the, on the ARC and PLC. And the Senate, in their proposal, wants to increase it from 86 to 88%. The House wants to go from 86 to 90%. So that's somewhat of a change. Then, since the beginning, um, the, the, there was always a 10% uh, uh, maximum ARC county payment of 10% of the guarantee. The Senate keeps that the same. The House wants to increase that from 10% to 12.5%. I don't know how they come up with that specific 12.5%, but that's what they're thinking. Now, the maximum PLC payment. Um, the current, I'll, I'll talk about the house first. The current rules keeps everything the same. So the maximum payment you could get on PLC is, is basically just the difference between the, re, the, 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 the reference price and the loan rate. Okay, that's the most you could receive. Then the loan rate would kick in and then uh, after that. Um, so there would be no PLC if the prices got below the loan rate. Now, the Senate, they have a, a proposal here to change that maximum to 20% of the, of the reference price. And I haven't really thought that through, how that would affect things. It depends on the magnitude of the, of the prices for various crops. Uh, I don't know that they could, to me, 20% for all crops, if they had varying percentage for various crops, uh, would make more sense to me. But we'll, we'll see what happens there. Other items, um, the loan rates have been are, are set very low, and they've been low for quite some time. Um, uh, uh, probably they probably would uh, uh, um, be increased, maybe a five-year average cost of production uh, capped at uh, at ten percent more than the current loan rates. Uh, there is enhancements to the dairy margin coverage, and there's also. Uh, uh, talk about authorizing a permanent standing disaster program, such as the, the emergency relief program that we're that we're in now. So those are the things that we know at this point. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little update. We know things will change, and I'll entertain questions uh, at the end. All right. Well, it looks like we do have one question that came in. Um, can we get the slide decks? If so, where and how? Um, so what we have been doing in the past has been recording these events. Um, and so if, if you want to watch and, and go through the slide decks again, you should be able to, to, to view the recordings. I guess we have not been posting um, the slide decks directly. Uh, but obviously, if you do have uh, interest in that, I'm sure you could contact the, the speakers and they'd be happy to send it to you if you do choose to do that. Okay. So that's what I guess I would recommend is, again, if there's something specific, please let us know and we'll we'll send it to you direct. All right. Anybody have, it doesn't look like uh, Dave Ripplinger made it back in time. He wasn't, he was going to try and make it back in time to, to add to the session today, but uh, it doesn't look like he's been able to join us yet. Um, Tim or Ron? Do you have any other comments? I guess I got one or two things we can talk about just to make sure that that everybody has a chance to type in their questions if there are any. But do you have any additional comments you'd like to make? I don't. Other, other, we did have that meeting this morning and somebody asked about the wheat price spike, you know, and you kind yeah. of covered that. But yeah, and, they and set the, up a buck. Why is wheat up a buck? And I said, supply and demand, you got to tune in this afternoon to tell frame the particulars. <laughs> yeah. So so again, just to summarize, I guess what's what it's really happening at the at the international level. It's not something happening local here within within this region or or within the United States specifically. The the big concerns is is some of the potential for smaller production coming out of Europe, in particular northern Europe and and the Europeans, as a as a the European Union as a group, does produce and and supply a lot of wheat into the global market, uh, primarily France, Germany, and to some degree England. Um, and so the fact that there was some frost damage in northern Europe was was an issue. 
the other, the probably the bigger motivation or the bigger issue that's going on right now is really the weather and some of the concerns for the the Russian wheat crop because they are a very very aggressive buy uh, seller into the global markets. Uh, they tend to be the lowest priced wheat hitting the marketplace. So obviously, if that low ball price um, supplier has less available, it kind of lifts the market for everybody uh, across the world. So that's really the the motivation behind the comments. You've got another question about how statewide planting going, and then I'll take the one on rebuilding the herd. But sure, state planting okay. progress. Sure. So planting progress uh, for well, so okay. So let's just go through for North Dakota. We're a little bit ahead. the The five year average is fifteen percent. Uh, we're currently at twenty two percent for corn. Uh, for soybeans, North Dakota. Let me look really quick. Uh, we're usually at 9%. We're currently at 5%. So if you look at five-year average versus today, the spring wheat is 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 really ahead of normal. Uh, so let me get to the spring wheat number really quick. North Dakota, we're currently at 49% planted and we're typically at 34% planted. So making pretty good progress on on the on the seeding this, this year, even though we've been having these rain showers and it's been kind of uh, planting in chunks. Okay, well, last time I covered more on how quick we can rebuild the herd. On the last cycle in 2014, we had a lot more bred heifers on hand in 2014, so we rebuilt the herd relatively quickly. This year, we're way down on replacement heifers, and our cow numbers are down. Again, we went down five years, and and uh, interest rates are higher and so on. And, you know, we, uh, even though in North Dakota, we had more replacement heifers this spring, they were calves that haven't went in with a bull yet. So it's going to take longer to rebuild the herd than it did last year. And again, you see that, you know, that maybe more dry weather moving in by fall. So it's a, it's going to be a slower process than before, although there is interest now. And and I, I, I showed more charts on that last time if you want to go back and, and look at, at uh, that recorded session. Okay, we had another question come in, where can I find these recorded webinars? Um, so at the end of today, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll stop the recording, um, give us a little bit of time, uh, probably by tomorrow, the recording for this program will be up and posted. Um, it's, you can actually find it in uh, at the NDSU Ag Hub uh, under the Events tab, or probably more simply, just let your, your favorite search engine find it. Just type in NDSU, um, let me get the title right, NDSU Ag Market Situation Webinar, and it should, should pop up. You should find the link to it automatically. It has a list of the of the dates for the the um, events, the, and then at the very bottom, towards the bottom, they'll have the recording for the most recent uh, version of it. So right now we have last month's. Um, this this new version today should be up and available within a day or two. Okay, there was another question: Will there be a late May frost? And I'm not a weather person, and none of us are here. But again, I was on a. A, uh, a drought call this morning with Daryl Richardson. There is a forecast by the end of May for a little bit of cooling off. And he said the chances are slight now, but still possible for some light frost at the end of the month. But as of now, it does not look uh, real promising. Uh, another question was any thoughts on the bird flu and possible impact on beef supplies? And uh, that's what has caused all the jitter in the futures market. The cash market has been behaving very uh, normal. And our cutout values this week are now back up over $300. And beef is moving for the spring season and so on. So it hasn't affected the market as, as yet. There was testing of hamburger in the U.S. by, you know, USDA and found no sense. So, yeah, if. And there has been no bird flu found in the beef cattle sector, but obviously, you know, stay tuned as news comes out and, you know, if there are, are, is more widespread problem and in the beef sector, for sure, the futures market would react to that. And so uh, the state veterinarian was on our call this morning and 
you know, uh, bird flu has not been the problem in North Dakota that was in the past and so on. So it's a wait and see. But as things come out and, you know, if they find more and it's in beef cattle and that hits the futures market, the futures market is jittery enough anyway, and, and that could affect the market. But as of now, it, is, it has had no impact on, on, on beef cattle or beef prices. So right. Very question. good. So if um, I wait just another minute or two to see if there's any additional questions. I guess um, while while we're waiting again, just for the last couple minutes here, I, I do want to make a comment. I guess the, I was I was wondering to see if someone would ask this question, but I'm starting to get get this question posed to me uh, periodically now over the last uh, few days. And there was recent announcement, uh, obviously, that the United States put some additional tariffs on Chinese products coming into the U.S. Um, it, the one that made the most press or had the biggest splash into the into the news cycle was on electric vehicles. That uh, Ch Chinese electric vehicles, instead of having a twenty five percent import tariff, they will now have a hundred percent import tariff, which is pretty substantial. Although we don't import a lot of electric vehicles from China right now. Um, steel, steel and aluminum went up from seven and a half to 25%. Semiconductors went from a 25% to a 50% increase or 50% tariff. Lithium ion batteries from seven and a half to 25%. And solar cells went from 25 to 50%. So um, a lot of this has to do with um, items and, and, and components that we buy from the Chinese or the Chinese companies. Uh, to be able to put into U.S. products, those are going to go up substantially. The question I'm starting to get now is, well, given our history with tariffs uh, in China, is this going to lead to another trade war? Obviously, nobody really knows that. Um, this is about politics. And again, forecasting politics is even more dangerous than trying to forecast the weather. So um, I, I don't know how this is going to play out. That's obviously something in back of people's minds, and there's a concern there. Um, so far, we haven't had any kind of signaling, both either positive or negative, from the Chinese government regarding their response to this, other than they said there would be a response. Um, so I, we just have to wait and see on that and whether agriculture and agricultural products are included in that response or not. We, we just don't know yet. Okay, another question is bird flu affecting poultry prices, creating a shortage of supply or fear in consumer demand. And the answer to that is no, the, the bird flu, although it is occurring in some states, is not as bad as it was. And in fact, turkey prices are uh, low, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, 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 and so, uh, supplies there. And really, it hasn't had... It had a little impact earlier on egg prices. I think maybe that was more the early Easter and so on. So not much impact on on poultry prices this year compared to, well, two years ago when it had a, quite a bit of impact and we weren't going to have enough turkey for Thanksgiving and all that, which didn't materialize. So, so, so far, uh, no, no reducing demand and, and uh, chicken and turkey are, are moving. Right. Okay. Well, I think we have basically come to the end of our program um, this time. So thank you guys for all attending. Uh, the next session, the next webinar will be on June 13th. Um, again, just a couple of days, a day after the WASDI report comes out. So June 13th, a Thursday at one o'clock PM. Uh, for those that have it registered, you should be able to receive an email notification and an update and a reminder that it's coming up. So uh, thank you again, everybody, for attending today, and hopefully you found this valuable, and we'll see you again next month. Thank you. Mm -hmm.